Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Debbie Brown. I'm the president of Colorado Business Roundtable, and it's an honor to welcome you to our launch event for the Road to Recovery Initiative. For today's event, we're launching our recommendations, and information can be found at roadtorecoverycolorado.org if you'd like to follow along on some of the information that we're providing. And you can also view the report on the website and download it as well. So to kick us off, and I appreciate all of you popping on, I know there's gonna be a few more folks joining. While COVID-19 has brought unprecedented challenges in terms of health and safety for Coloradans and the business community, the disruption has also brought an opportunity to rethink and rework policies that could further elevate Colorado into a faster and more sustainable economic recovery. So during the pandemic, we've seen businesses rise to the challenge of protecting employees and customers, reimagining ways to deliver services, and going above and beyond to support the relief efforts. This understanding of the role of business will be more critical as ever as we look to businesses to reopen and rehire and ultimately to recharge our economy in the short and the long term. In recent years, we've been very fortunate in Colorado to have an even more diversified economy and we're now well established in industries ranging from agriculture to technology. But the economic hardship brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic has unearthed new modern challenges, such as remote work and education, fragile supply lines, and it magnifies even old challenges, including affordable health care, technological disruption, and a changing workforce. While there have been many teams assembled since COVID um, hit to collaborate on short and long-term strategies, and our organization has been involved in many of those as well, we were inspired by some of the work brought on by our counterpart in Michigan, the Michigan Business Roundtable, and how they assembled more private sector leaders to lean in. And it's more critical than ever that um, all of us lean in to this time to be problem solvers. So in partnership, the Colorado Business Roundtable and Common Sense Institute teamed up to develop data-backed strategies for success and forward momentum. And together we marshaled an influential group of Coloradans that you'll, some of them you'll hear from today, leaders in energy, aerospace, tech, finance, real estate, and more, as well as thought leaders on economic development and the future of work. As we prepared our Road to Recovery initiative, we discussed philosophically and practically what it means to measure the success of our economy and economic success should be reflective of the success of all Coloradans and no one should be left out. For this reason, we included data that tracks key quality of life indicators as well as personal success measures. So thinking through the conversation today, we're going to look at three key pillars that our group um, will be discussing for you. One is prioritizing a competitiveness agenda. So we know that sustainable economic growth can be maximized when we achieve a proper regulatory balance and support fiscal policies that promote innovation, job attraction and retention. Colorado competes for jobs with other states and globally, and we need to be mindful of how we're positioned in the wider marketplace. Pillar number two is about reimagining tomorrow's workforce. Building a tomorrow ready workforce requires modernizing training pipelines embracing technology and strengthening post-secondary education options so Colorado's youth and working adults can secure fulfilling jobs and sustainable career pathways. And last but not least, pillar three is about investing in a future forward infrastructure, knowing that it's critical to unleash Colorado's long-term competitive potential. Colorado should focus on issues such as mobility, energy, and broadband and 5G because they are the backbone to support a strong economy, business growth, and quality of life. So the Road to Recovery Initiative engaged in the following process. We identified these key pillars with the thought leaders that we brought together and tried to simplify what we felt like would be critical to um, Colorado's economic success post-COVID. Second, we had periods of time for brainstorming and collaboration, particularly in the summer and early fall. And then we spent some time vetting the recommendations with additional outside expertise. What is already being done that we can amplify? And there's a lot of incredible work that's already being done that we've included in this report. And then what is and what isn't operationally feasible and how can it be implemented perhaps in the short and long term? 
So today, this is really a snapshot in time brought primarily by the private sector, but also leaning into partners in academia, community and government on how we can lean in a little bit more for our economic recovery. And we welcome the opportunity to brief you on the recommendations and we welcome your involvement. If this is something you'd like to be involved in as we look at 2.0 version, uh, we hope that you reach out to us and let us know how we can um, partner with you. Next, I'd like to introduce Kristen Strom, President and CEO of Common Sense Institute. And Kristen will talk about CSI's role in the project. So welcome, Kristen. Thank you so much, Debbie. It's hard to imagine that this initiative's been underway for six months now. I'd first like to take a moment to thank all of our contributors that you can see listed here on the screen right now. All of these amazing individuals helped contribute and shape this report. They represent various sectors to our economy and our industries in Colorado. We greatly appreciate the time that they all put in to help contribute to this exceptional piece of work. As Debbie mentioned, we focused on three key pillars for the report. And for each of the pillars, the Common Sense Institute's team of economists put together key pillar indicators that helped frame policy recommendations with key metrics and data. Where were we in 2019? Where are we now? And where do we wanna be as a state moving forward? In doing this, the initiative roadmap can clearly measure Colorado's progress on these three pillars. Prior to 2020 and the global economic and cultural upheaval brought by the COVID pandemic, Colorado stood out for having a strong economic growth and offering a desirable lifestyle. We had created the number one economy in the nation and were experiencing competitive advantages in attracting business growth and an educated workforce. The US News World Report ranked Colorado's business climate across the board as a top 10 state in the nation at the end of 2019. But fast forward to today. Due to the pandemic, many businesses have faced closures and restrictions, and the state's unemployment rate at one point jumped to a staggering 12.2% in April. This was the highest level since record keeping began in 1976. Staggeringly, data shows 602,000 unemployment insurance claims were made at the start of the pandemic. And now one in five Coloradans have filed for some sort of unemployment throughout the pandemic. If you look at second quarter real GDP, it was 9% below 2019 fourth quarter levels with the largest industry reductions in jobs across key sectors like hospitality, followed by healthcare, social assistance, arts, entertainment, recreation, finance, and insurance. As of October, we have 125,000 fewer jobs in Colorado. And from our research, we found that women with kids have been disproportionately impacted throughout the pandemic. But it's not all bad news right now. Throughout the last eight months, overall, Colorado has fared relatively better than national averages. Despite the recent positive signs in the recovery, however, the COVID crisis is far from over. And as Coloradans, we know good isn't good enough. How do we protect Colorado's business-friendly environment, meet Colorado's workforce demands, and improve our infrastructure, and come out of the pandemic stronger than ever, maintaining, if not surpassing, those top 10 indicators that we're so proud of? The residual effects of the current recession can be mitigated with a clear and intentional path forward. Sustained growth and improved economic expansion for all Coloradans will require thoughtful and strategic policy decisions in the near term. And using 2019 data and current economic data as a benchmark and mapping a path towards where we wanna be in the future, it can provide a guide towards our future tra trajectory. You'll find in the report these key pillar indicators and metrics for each of the three pillars, and I invite you to explore them. Before we dive into the specifics on the recommendations on these three pillars, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, AT&T, the Colorado Contractors Association, Deloitte, and Rocky Mountain Mechanical Contractors Association. 
In addition, I want to thank our two media sponsors and partners today, the Denver Gazette and Dan Denver 7. Vince and Brian, thank you so much for joining us to help moderate this important discussion. I will note that if you do have questions throughout the program, feel free to use the chat function or as Debbie mentioned, reach out to us as well. We'd love to hear from you. I wanna turn it over to Vince first. Vince is a Colorado native who has a long career covering national and local politics. He's the editor with the newly formed Denver Gazette and we're thrilled that you're with us today. Vince, I'll turn it over to you. Kristen, thank you very much. And thank everybody for having me here. You know, launching a brand new Denver newspaper during COVID, our team is extremely familiar with the challenges and the opportunities this time and economy present. So as Christian mentioned in 2019, US News ranked Colorado's economy by some measures as number one in the nation, driven by 2.3% job growth compared to a national average of 1.2%, a 2.5% unemployment rate and 4.87% growth and personal income per person. So those were the days, right? And I think the ambition of this road to recovery is to get us back to that and then some. So let's go right to the first pillar, prioritizing a competitiveness agenda. And I'd like to introduce our panelists and then jump right into questions. Uh, our first panelist is Liz Peets, and she's the Vice President of Government Affairs at the Colorado Association of Realtors. Our second panelist uh, for the first pillar is Chris Schmidt, and Chris is the managing partner for the Denver Deloitte office. So let's jump right in with you, Chris. Uh, my first question, why is competitiveness one of the three key pillars mentioned in this report? Well, thanks, Vince. Um, so, you know, one of the things we know from experience and data is that companies make decisions about their locations where they decide to remain, move, or adding more employees and facilities based on several criteria. So when we started the Road to Recovery project, we focused on some of those criteria, which Debbie outlined in terms of the pillars, availability of workers and the talent pool, infrastructure, things like roads, airports, supply routes, broadband, and then competitiveness, the one that uh, Liz and I both worked on. So when we talk about competitive, competitiveness, think in terms of things like the cost of doing business. Uh, what's the tax regime for both employees and businesses? What's the cost of labor? What's the cost of utilities, insurance, and commercial real estate? Um, think about the regulatory environment. Is it particularly onus, onerous, or not? Um, and then, lastly, you know, what is it? What's what's the cost of living like? The cost of housing, the cost of childcare. So those are the components of competitiveness and why we felt it was important to include that as one of the three pillars we evaluated. Thanks so much, Chris. So Liz, let's go to you for another question. If Colorado is a top economy, why is it important to focus on housing and childcare? Well, thank you, Vince. I think those two areas you'll see in the recommendations were areas where we actually saw the pandemic really affect and potentially worsen. We had a lot of in-migration from other states and we had a lot of high unaffordability in our housing market. But we also have a lot of regulatory barriers and one of the eighth highest costs of childcare in the country, over $1,300 a month. Both of these issue areas are at a tipping point. And housing and childcare are workforce issues as much as they are important issues to Coloradans. And the reason you're seeing us focus on those is because we think we can make a difference. Looking at either expedited permitting or creative use of property, we have the opportunity to look at those areas with eyes of innovation. And I think that's what these recommendations show today. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, that eighth in the nation really jumped out at me. Uh, Chris, how about a follow up from you? How do we make Colorado more competitive? So Vince, I'd answer that by saying we need to think in terms of uh, those areas where we excel currently and focusing on how we preserve and protect them. And then the areas where we already know we have challenges and how we address them with creative solutions. So in the first category, think for example about um, how we have a relatively good individual and corporate flat tax rate structure which we need to preserve. So that falls in the category of one of those areas we need to really focus on preserving. 
especially in light of the fact that uh, some of the other business related taxes are likely to ri rise related to COVID. So things like unemployment taxes, for example. We also need to preserve our current regulatory uh, environment by increasing transparency and fiscal visibility by making sure we engage those impacted proactively um, with proposed changes. And, you know, looking at requiring proposed regulations and legislation and ballot initiatives to provide an associated cost benefit analysis, you know, a price tag, if you will. Um, on the flip side of that are those areas where we already know we have challenges and need to address like affordable housing and child care costs, like Liz mentioned. Um, and in those areas, you know, looking at ways to incentivize residential and commercial property owners to potentially repurpose property based on our post COVID-19 market needs and expediting permitting again, as Liz mentioned. Um, and then lastly, we, we really got to address the, uh, the child care cost um, issue. Eighth in the nation just isn't where it needs to be and we need to be proactive about how we deal with that. So obviously there's lots more recommendations in the report and too many to discuss in our short time. But wanted to leave you with this last bit of information. Um, we're already seeing, seeing the state slip backwards in a couple of areas. We mentioned the US News report, which ranks Colorado relatively high. Um, there's also three other reports where we slip. So the chief executive best states for business, we dropped from 2018 to 19, from eighth to 12th. Um, similarly, in the Forbes best states for business, we dropped from fifth to ninth over those same two years. And then lastly, the Wall Street Journal, best and worst places for business, we slipped from two to three in 18 and 19. So None of it tragic, but obviously the trend's there that we're slipping already. And so that's why we uh, feel that these recommendations are timely and we need to act. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. Appreciate those specifics too. Uh, let's, go, let's go back to you for one more question. So, you know, given all the uh, statistics that Chris just mentioned uh, and the backsliding, are you optimistic about the future? And if so, why? Uh, thank you, Vince. I am really optimistic, and I think the time is now. We have a top educated workforce. We're innovative. That's what's kept Colorado on top. And we have a high quality of life, so people obviously want to come here. Our challenge is making sure that the business private sector is working together with the public sector so that we don't have these regulations that could change our current environment. And I think we're up to the task. We just have to work together to get it done. Great, thank you very much, Liz. And thanks for ending on that high note. So now I'm gonna hold, I'm gonna hand it over to Brian Sanders uh, at uh, the Morning Anchor at Denver 7 uh, and let him talk about Pillars 2 and Pillars 3. Thank you very much, over to you, Brian. All right, thank you, Vince. And uh, thank you to Debbie and Kristen for allowing me to be a part of this discussion. Uh, obviously, um, road to recovery or the rebound uh, of businesses is something we talk about in our newscasts on a daily basis. And, uh, and I have a, a series at Denver 7 called In Good Company, uh, where I highlight Colorado owned and based businesses each week, showcasing some of the uh, innovation and the creativity uh, and successes of business in our community, because there's a real affinity to support uh, Colorado made and owned products and services and businesses. And um, we certainly, as a member of the media, want to be a, a voice and a, and a helping hand in lifting up the community when we, when we come out of this pandemic. So uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this discussion. Uh, Pillar two is about reimagining tomorrow's workforce, uh, which we know will be critical whenever we do come out of this. And I'd like to introduce co-chair Dave DeVia, and Dave is the Executive Vice President and CEO of the Rocky Mountain Mechanical Contractors Association, which serves uh, 200 members. And so Dave- I didn't uh, get that. Could you try again? Sorry, that was my Siri. It wasn't me. Siri, Siri was uh, Zoom bombing us there. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to ask you, Dave, when we talk about reimagining tomorrow's workforce, uh, what does that mean to you and why is it pillar two here? Thanks, Brian, and uh, thanks to you and Vince uh, for helping us put this event together, and Kristen and Debbie for your leadership. 
this has been a very exciting project, at least from where I sit. My colleague, Scott Hughes, who is the National Director at Apple Strategic Initiatives, uh, unfortunately couldn't be here today. He let me know that yesterday. So hopefully uh, he was the shock and I'm the awe of today's uh, Pillar 2. So you're unfortunately stuck with me, but he sends his regards. Um, while this is a, a labor of love for him, like it has been for me, uh, his employer called and, and needed him to uh, do some things today. So uh, reimagining tomorrow's workforce uh, in a nutshell is, you know, I think it was touched on in Pillar 1, uh, technology is evolving jobs at a faster pace today than ever before. Uh, we have an ever-changing market. Uh, Ten years ago, Airbnb, Uber, and other types of technology didn't exist, and so the workforce is morphing. Higher education institutions are doing a wonderful job at training our uh, workforce for the employers, but there's also this, this gap, uh, we, we believe, uh, and so we put together some very thoughtful recommendations. I had a committee that I worked with from including uh, folks on the Colorado Workforce Council at the state, all the way to private employers such as Ball, Apple, and many others. Uh, and um, a lot of great sessions were really two different initiatives at a high level. There's a series of four initiatives under the P to 20 uh, recommendations and another six initiatives for skilled workforce. Um, today, I think the proposition that parents are faced with um, and students and counselors is, you know, if you don't go to school and get that um, uh, degree, you're not going to be successful. And I would argue, being from the trades, uh, we have many jobs that are six figure jobs that uh, don't require necessarily that high or that uh, uh, the college diploma. Fact is in 2019, 74% of all jobs require some form of post-secondary education, yet only 64% of high school graduates are going on to seek that. And there's a void. That's a void that we think we can fill. Uh, for those of you listening online, uh, our recommendations start on page 12 and go through 14 on the report. So if you wanna follow along. And Dave, you mentioned with uh, with technology moving at such a fast pace now and coming into play more than ever before and closing that gap, what does the workforce of the future look like and how can it include all Coloradans, not just those that want to pursue a four year degree? Well, certainly, um, and Brian, that's a great question. I think that, you know, technology today we're meeting in this venue as to where we normally would have had a big uh, event and invited many people. Uh, to, to come and participate and attend. Um, and so it's really taught us to rethink about how we engage with the community, communities of Durango and La Junta and Otero, uh, of Northeastern Colorado, uh, of folks up in Route County and Summit County um, and uh, all the way over in Grand Junction. Uh, and that, that's something what we need to do and make sure that everybody has access to career and talent pipelines and they can see themselves in those career paths. And that's really what we're thinking about and really trying to suggest in Pillar 2. Um, and, you know, a wise man once told me, um, in order to be successful in life, you have to exploit the positives and minimize the negatives. And there's a lot of great positive stories here. And so you'll see that reflective in our report. Um, so we want to continue those things. But, um, you know, with the evolution that we have before us, there is some things that maybe... Um, aren't being highlighted, uh, which would fall in that negative category. And so we really have to work to, uh, you know, uh, educate students and parents that, you know, for example, uh, a career in the construction industry is just as meaningful, is just as prestigious, and has just as many learning opportunities. Um, high school student can go into college and in you know, 2,700 credit hours, get an associate's degree, 5,400 credit hours, get a bachelor's degree or contact hours um, rather. But in our apprenticeship centers, um, we provide them with, and I wanna get this right, 9,730 training hours. It's almost double that of a bachelor's degree and the earning potentials there, but just not uh, the value proposition put before people. Colorado, we employ 185,000 Coloradans in construction. Um, and so we're, we're really trying to evaluate how we deliver that message 
to students, parents, and counselors in uh, the second part of Pillar 2. And Dave, uh, kind of spinning off Pillar 1 about the competitiveness, how does Colorado compare with uh, the rest of the country in regards to workforce? Well, I think that um, our economic, uh, our uh, EDC partners have done a tremendous job in recruiting great businesses to the state uh, and retaining those that are here, uh, but we can do better. Nine months ago or eight months ago, uh, we had the lowest unemployment in the country. Uh, and so employers really had to figure out how they presented their value proposition uh, to tomorrow's workers. And that has to continue and we have to double down now. Um, there is a tremendous amount of pressure being put on hospitality right now with COVID uh, folks in the hotel industry and the restaurant industry. And there are a lot of my neighbors, I'm a fifth generation Denver native, uh, and there are a lot of people hurting right now. And so pillar two is to say, hey, come, come join us in construction, in technology, and other uh, great industries that are growing and give them a pathway to see themselves there. And once we can uh, train everybody up, how does a skilled workforce meet our changing demands right now? Well, I kind of touched on this, Brian, in the beginning, you know, what we're focused on in the construction on the second part of uh, Pillar uh, 2 is, you know, uh, going to an apprenticeship program should not be a comparative to college. It, we should be able to compete just the same with college. My, our average apprentices are 28 years old. So they've already graduated high school, they've graduated college and or gotten a GED and, and gone on to some post-secondary uh, training. Uh, but then they figured out that, you know, they want to settle down and have a family and earn a good living and, and have benefits and retirement and all the other things that go along with getting a little bit older in life. Uh, and so pillar two is really to reimagine how the skilled trades and our apprenticeship training programs uh, are comparative and an equal to everything else that's out there. You know, Scott Hughes will tell you, uh, and you, everybody has one, uh, Apple, you know, and um, they, they compete really well for technology and in tomorrow's workforce, uh, but, you know, construction doesn't do as good of a job and we need to do better. It's a lot to tackle and uh, certainly appreciate your insight there. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for the questions. Uh, moving on to pillar three now, which is investing in a future forward infrastructure. And I'd like to introduce co-chairs Roberta Robinette. Uh, Roberta is the president of AT&T Colorado and supports new technology deployment and infrastructure investment. And Terry Stevenson, who is a shareholder of Stevenson Group, a family owned and operated holding company, which owns and operates several automotive franchises and several real estate holdings within the greater Denver metro area. Thank you, Terry and Roberta for joining us today. Um, so with regard to a future forward infrastructure, I'll start with you, Terry. What do you mean by uh, infrastructure? Uh, a lot of components to it and, and why was this decided on as a third pillar? Uh, if you look at the, def the dictionary definition um, on infrastructure, the fundamental facilities and systems serving a country city or areas, transportation, communication systems, power plants, and schools uh, is what they define as infrastructure. Each of these areas are well, as well as energy, water, land use are important in their own right and essential to the collective. Uh, these are the things, these are the fundamental elements that create a strong societal platform. And that's what infrastructure is. It's not just one element, it's all these combined. It's that foundation to building a strong economy and a strong society. Um, we focused primarily on, while education, land use, and water are important elements, our structure, we focus more on the, uh, pay attention more to communication, uh, the broadband and 5G, energy, mobility, especially transportation. That was the three areas of which we did our, most of our focus on. Uh, not the other ones weren't important, but we kind of focused on those three to begin with. That's who we are. And as we uh, lay the groundwork to hopefully work our way out of this pandemic, uh, Roberta, has uh, COVID highlighted our need for infrastructure? 
Yeah, and thank you for the question. Um, I guess I would first start out by saying that really our, our policymakers and I know several of the contributors to this report, as well as other stakeholders, you know, we've been having these discussions for, for several years when it comes to the needs um, of just our, the different multiple infrastructures here in Colorado. Um, but I think what happened when COVID hit is um, our general population, most Coloradans all of a sudden um, were hit pretty hard and, and realized very quickly how important connectivity is. Um, we had folks that all of a sudden needed to start working from home. They had kids that were attending school online um, and a lot of folks were trying to get their healthcare needs um, addressed online as well. And so it became very apparent very quickly um, that not only do we need to be connected, but we also need to have the capacity um, to have multiple family members online at the same time. And so um, although broadband, I think, was, was highlighted and took center stage uh, during this pandemic as one of the um, needs that the state needs to start addressing, um, but I would, I would say and I, and I hope that um, even after the pandemic um, and we continue to have these discussions about broadband infrastructure, we can't let that overshadow the importance of the other two infrastructures that are also going to continue to play in our state's economic recovery. Yeah, and just to let you know, I'm broadcasting from a uh, co-working space right now because my wife is teaching from home and my son is learning from home, so I hear you. Um, Terry, back to you uh, as the report digs into transportation, uh, what were some of the big takeaways about transportation infrastructure in your perspective? Uh, transportation was indeed a major focus. Uh, we were lucky to have Brett Ames and Tony Milo and Henry Silvanay on our team. Uh, earlier in the year, Henry Silvanay and Ben Stein uh, joined together to co-author a study for Common Sense Institute uh, on the areas of, of transportation in Colorado. It was kind of the, the, the platform and the that information and discussion with them was what kind of helped us start this whole process out. Um, the question is, is in looking at, at the infrastructure as a whole, is not so much how what we how we fund it, but where the money comes from. Uh, until you have the money, you can't really determine how to fund it. So, first question is, you know, where do you, where do the funds come from? Second, how do we prioritize the funds so that each element receives its needed share? And third, how do we establish a sustainable funding method in order to keep the infrastructure maintained and improved over time? Every one of the elements are all going to be are going to deteriorate over time, and they all need to be maintained as we move forward. Creating and maintaining such a multi-layered infrastructure that includes education, communication, energy, water, land use, mobility, technology, human services, safety, and the environment are all ports with the community of, of community foundation. Each component is important in its own right, yet each is essential to the overall group. And if we put more emphasis, undue emphasis on one over another, we undermine the entire structure. It's like playing a game of Jenga. Um, and so the takeaway really is how do we balance the needs and then how do we fund it? Looking forward. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, and, and Roberta, uh, back to you with, with regards to communication and broadband, uh, what are some of your recommendations moving forward? Yeah, so in the report, we identified several areas for improvement. Um, and, and I just wanna let everybody know that, you know, we have been already working with um, the administration as well as policymakers and local government representatives on trying to address these issues. Um, but in this report, we really try to focus on things um, that not only are gonna help in the long term, but things that we can implement today um, and so just to kind of cover over a lot, some of the things that we make the recommendations on, um, we can begin by increasing transparency and improve coordination between the state and private service providers. Um, we also discuss the need to coordinate the state and federal broadband funding grants. Um, I'm not, I don't know if folks are aware of this, but there actually is quite a bit of money that comes into the state for broadband deployment. Unfortunately, it comes from 
a lot of different federal departments. And we also here in the state have several departments that partake in providing broadband grants. And so what we're saying is we really need to find out where is all of this money going? Um, and so what we're trying to ask for is, let's get an idea of where that money is going. So we need more coordination uh, between those departments. And, and I will say we worked very closely um, with legislators and the governor's office during this special session, specifically um, to talk about uh, broadband dollars going to the Department of Education. And that was one of the things that we really talked about was making sure that they were coordinating with the other departments within the administration that also have broadband oversight. And so that is a, a great beginning. We need to make sure that our other departments are doing that as well. Um, and then we need to really focus on where are our truly unserved or underserved areas. Um, and we need to, to, to make sure that those dollars, uh, whether it be federal dollars or state dollars, are not being built in, are not being used, excuse me, um, and spent in areas that there's already a network. The last thing we wanna start doing is overbuilding where we already have networks. We need to make sure we're getting everybody onto the highway. Um, and so we need to have better coordination there. And then finally, uh, we really need to start working um, with our local governments to standardize and streamline their permitting requirements. Um, a lot of times this is where uh, we find our obstacles. And so uh, we really need to, to try and get them uh, to really streamline that process for us. Um, and then also at the state and local government um, levels, we would like better access and improved access to public rights of way, because I think that is really um, gonna help uh, with broadband deployment as well. Hopefully the funds coming from the special session and um, you know, the money allocated in the governor's budget for next year will be a good start. So Roberta, thank you, Terry, thank you both for your insight. And uh, Debbie, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much. And um, as we're wrapping up today, I wanna let you know that Kristen and I are happy to take your questions, whether it's in the chat feature or if you reach out to us directly. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar today, we, uh, all the information can be found at roadtorecoverycolorado.org, including downloading the, downloading the report and our contact information as well. Also, if you're interested in being a part of collaborating with us um, on some factors as we move forward, again, this is a snapshot in time. We're gonna be working on this issue probably for the next couple of years as Colorado seeks to come out of the recovery as strong as ever. We welcome your support and collaboration as well. I also want to thank our sponsors again for helping us, um, the Denver Gazette, Deloitte, AT&T, Colorado Contractors Association, RMMCA, and uh, Denver 7 for being a part of the event today and for also leaning in to how we can all work together, um, particularly during this hard time. So what I'd love to end with is I, uh, some optimism. I, I, we had some of the co-chairs especially who lent a little optimism you know, Colorado starts with such a great economic uh, climate before COVID, and we've got a feisty collaborative spirit as Coloradans who want to lean in and try to work together to make Colorado uh, as, as big of a success, if not bigger, coming out of it. And we believe that within disruption, there certainly is an opportunity, an opportunity to protect and influence on our economic success and also ensure sustainable and long-term economic growth. So we know that uh, we've been talking a lot about business and the economy, and I wanna also make sure uh, you know that when we talk about that, it's because it has, the, it has the opportunity to change people's lives. Business isn't about business, it's about um, supporting livelihoods, supporting Coloradans, and our hope is that a lot of these recommendations certainly help lift all Coloradans up in all four corners of our state. So we appreciate your time. Um, today, I wanna to again thank our co-chairs who've, who've leaned in the last several months in a really big way and all of the contributors who've been a part of it. And again, thanks to Brian and to Vince for being a part of um, the event and helping us spread the word on the great work that we're trying to do. And on that note, I thank everyone for being a part of our program today. And this concludes our time together. So thank you for joining us.